So we have our Christmas Eve services coming up and just really looking forward uh, to just this holiday. And that being said, we're in this series entitled God With Us. And this is our Christmas series. And the foundational verse for this series is, in Ma- is found in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, uh, where uh, the angels are describing that this miraculous birth that's taking place uh, is, is really a fulfillment of prophecy. And that prophecy originally is found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where it says that this, the Christ child, his name shall be called Emmanuel. Everybody say Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which translated means God with us, right? God with us. And so we started talking about that last week. What does that mean? How does that impact us? Uh, how practical can that get, you know? And so that's what we started last week. We're going to continue with that uh, again uh, today. And um, as we take a look at some of the different um, some of the different uh, uh, things that this incredible truth, God being with us, what that says to us, what that means to us. One of the passages that I want to look at uh, this morning is, is really not this, what you would consider a Christmas passage or a Christmas verse. I wanted to use one. There's so many that we could use in Matthew and the book of Luke. But I ended up finding myself here in John chapter 1. If you'll take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to John, the first chapter. Now, some of these verses that I'm going to read, I, at the la- I, I kind of included them in the last minute so the guys in the back don't have those. But, but the verses that we're going to really focus on will be on the screen. But in John chapter 1, there's this interchange, this interaction that takes place ultimately between uh, Jesus and a man by the name of Nathaniel. But there are some things that happen leading up to that, and, that, and those... Those events start in verse 43 in John chapter 1, and it says this, The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. That was his command, his invitation. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip, after Jesus spoke to him, and Philip was just knew, he knew that he was the Christ. Philip then went and found Nathanael. Philip went and found Nathanael. Folks, I'm telling you, one of the greatest privileges we have as believers is to, as, a, as children of God, for us to, as a child of God, to tell another potential child of God that they have a father they haven't met yet. What a beautiful opportunity, right, guys? When you're sharing your faith, think of it in those terms. It's one child telling another child that they have a father they're not even aware that they have. That is so beautiful, isn't it? It's so powerful when we take advantage of the opportunity, like Philip immediately went and found his friend. Nathaniel's got to know about this. I cannot keep this from Nathaniel. This is way too good. Everybody say good. It's going to mean something later on. This is way too good to not tell Nathaniel about it. So he goes to Nathaniel and he says to him, we have found him whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. In other words, we found the Messiah. Verse 46, Nathanael's response was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, there, we're going to go back and look at that, but that, that, that reads real pretty right now, but there was, a, there was an edge to that. You know, there, there, was, there was something on that. And Philip said to him, well, come and see for yourself. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he, and he said of him, behold, an Israelite, Indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? You will see even greater things than these. And Jesus went on to say, most assuredly, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, from this point on, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So I want us to take a look at at just this encounter between Jesus and Nathanael because this this picture that really the the last picture that we see painted in this passage of Jesus talking about uh, the, the angels ascending and descending that heaven being open and, the, and this, this activity of heaven taking place on the earth. It, it, it's such a beautiful picture of this truth that we're looking at this month. The fact that his name is Emmanuel, which translated means God really 
is with us. He's with us. There's no more scratching, clawing. There's no more crawling over broken glass. There's no more striving. There's no more futile human attempt to try to reach God. Instead, God has come down to rescue man. Instead of requiring us to somehow try to figure out a way to build a tower high enough to reach God, God says, you're not going to be able to do that. There's no way you're going to be able to achieve that. Let me come to you instead of you trying to come to me. Emmanuel, God with us. Can we thank God for that right there? I mean, that is, that is just, that, that, was, that changed the universe, actually. So when we look at this, this, this interaction here between, between Jesus and Nathaniel, and we look at it in, in the light of or in the context of God being with us, this amazing truth. When we look at the story, we see, here's what we see. We see that God being with us and God with us, first of all, means that He sees us when no one else does. You know, again, when uh, Jesus finally met Nathaniel, Nathaniel finally met Jesus, Jesus says, look, an Israelite in whom there's, 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 there's no deceit. And Nathaniel's response was, how do you know me? And Jesus said, I, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. When he came to you and you were sitting under that fig tree, I saw you. God being with us means that God sees us, guys, even when no one else does. See, this fig tree... This fig tree, these fig trees were planted in the gardens of, of Jewish homes. This was Nathaniel's personal garden. This was his secret place. This was his place where they would, this is this place where he would go and he would sit and he would pray or he would cry. This is the place where he would wrestle. With, his, with questions. This is the place when no one else was looking and he didn't want anybody else to see. This is the place he would go to to voice his greatest fears, to shed his tears, to wonder, to ask, to think, to try to hear, to try to receive, to try to make sense of his world when he's facing difficulties. This is what that fig tree represented. And he didn't want anybody else to see it. This needed to happen away from the prying eyes of his neighbors. This was just Philip in this place of prayer underneath this fig tree. And what we see here in Jesus' response is, Philip, I saw you. I heard what you said. I've heard every prayer that you've prayed. I saw you. I saw every tear that you've shed. I was there. God being with us means that God sees us even when no one else does, even when no one else should, even when we don't want anybody else to see it. Folks, I'm telling you, no matter where you're at, no matter how hidden you are from anyone else and everyone else, even if you feel invisible to everyone else, you're not invisible to God. He is with us and He sees you even when no one else does. Psalm 38 verse 9 says this, Lord, you know all my desires. You know my deepest longings. My tears are liquid words. And you can read them all. Think about that, folks. That is such a that verse describes what's happening here with Nathaniel and this message. This is the thing that this is the thing that's so important for us to understand today. God's with us. Heaven has been opened. The activity of heaven is happening around us all the time. We are not alone. And even when we think we're alone, God sees us. Not only does he see us, but he cares. He's attentive. He's aware. He's paying attention. Again, the psalmist says, you know all my desires. He knows your desires. He knows your deepest longings. And what I really love about this verse, it's so insightful. The psalmist says, my tears are liquid words. 
when I can't even articulate what I'm feeling, when I don't even know how to voice my frustration, when I'm not even able to put into words, God, what's really going on in my heart, you look at my tears, and my tears are enough for you. You're able to translate and to interpret and understand exactly the deepest longings that I have in my heart. I don't have to say the right words. I don't have to pray the right prayers. If all I do is just weep, you take my tears and translate them into words. You are with me. You understand me and you see me when no one else does. Does this make sense, everybody? There's, a, there's another verse in the Psalms, in Psalm 3, where the psalmist says, I lay down, I, I, I lay down and I slept, but I woke up in the safety of the Lord, for he was watching over me. God is with us. Even when we're in a secret place, God is still there with us. Even when we're sleeping, tossing and turning, wrestling with thoughts, the scriptures tell us that God's watching over us. You may not feel it. You may not be aware of it. You may not have been cognizant of it. You just may need to be reminded of it today that in your darkest moments, that in your quietest times, in your most secret places, even when you don't know how to say it or pray it or, or explain it, even when you're wrestling, God's watching over you and He is listening to you and He sees you. He sees you. I see, are you hearing what I'm saying? There's so many times where my, my granddaughters will just tug on me, want to get my attention. Paw, paw. They pull on my hair, especially when it gets longer. They pull on my hair. They, they pull on my, my sleeve, they on my arm. Paw, 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 paw. And they're wanting my attention. And so oftentimes what I've done is they're, they're pulling on me. I've actually had a, a few times some of them just grab my face and just put like this towards their face. And to assure them that they have my attention. Do you know what I say? I see you. I see you. Honey, I see you. That's me telling them I'm locked in. You don't have to try to get my attention anymore. I see you. Or do you hear what I'm saying? God is with us. He sees you. He sees you. He's aware. And unlike my granddaughters, you don't have to pull on his sleeve. You don't have to get his face and move it towards you. What I'm saying is he sees you when no one else does. He's with us. Amen. We see that with Nathaniel. The other thing that we see in this interaction with Nathaniel is that God with us means also that we don't have to be defined by our worst moments. And I'm not talking about the worst moments that we bring on ourselves. It does include that. But this even includes the worst moments that happen or the worst moments that are a result of just life or maybe even the choices and decisions of others. It doesn't matter where those worst moments came from, whether we contributed to those or whether we were just completely blindsided by those. Whether, that's wor whether those worst moments are as, as a doctor's report we didn't expect or a job we didn't expect to lose or a loss that we didn't expect to experience or maybe a worst moment that we brought on ourselves God with us tells us that we don't have to be defined. We don't have to be imprisoned, imprisoned by our worst moments. Now, here's why I say this. Philip goes to Nathaniel. We read it. And he says, we found him. We found him. The Messiah. And Nathaniel says, he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel's response was, can anything good? Can anything good, good, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And I know, again, that doesn't, it's kind of hard to catch what's, you know how sometimes people will say, do, do I detect a note of sarcasm? This isn't a note. This is a symphony of sarcasm. This is negative. This is skepticism. This is sarcasm. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Are you kidding me? Nazareth? Seriously? Can't, no way. Not now. I mean, maybe another city. If you could have mentioned any other city, I maybe I might have believed you that the Messiah, this guy's the Messiah. But coming from Nazareth, really? Not Nazareth. Unbelief coming right out of his mouth. What an attitude. I'm telling you, it reads pretty in your Bible. But Nathaniel had a stinky, stinky, stinky attitude. It's horrible. 
judgmental, critical, skeptical, full of unbelief. He almost snarled the word, words. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I'm telling you. Here's what's interesting. When Jesus meets him, now remember, later on, Jesus, when he said, how do you know me? Nathaniel said, Jesus, well, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. I'm pretty sure he not only saw Nathaniel, I'm pretty sure he heard him. I'm pretty sure Jesus heard Nathaniel when he was sitting under the fig tree and snarling at Philip going, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And when they finally meet, isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't make any reference to what Nathaniel said? Instead, Jesus celebrates his heart and his honesty and doesn't say anything about what he said. And not, this is why I'm telling you that because he's with us means that God's desire is not to, not to uh, imprison us or define us by our worst moments in life. The message, is, the message really is that we are more than the worst thing we've ever done and we are more than the worst thing that's ever been done to us. He's with us. He could have said to Nathaniel, I heard what you said. Boy, you were throwing shade on me, my hometown. I mean, boy, what is your problem? He could have, he could have responded so easily. Jesus could have responded by confronting Nathaniel with his skepticism, his unbelief, his judgment, his, his elitism, his, his superior attitude. And Jesus didn't highlight any of that. Instead, Jesus celebrated what he knew was really, he, what Jesus did is he celebrated the best of Nathaniel and he didn't highlight the worst of Nathaniel. How many of you are thankful that that is the God that is with you? The one that celebrates the best of you and doesn't constantly remind you about the worst part of you. Are, does that make sense, everybody? And honestly, you know, I, I, I've said this before that, that, one of the greatest revelations that Jesus brought to humanity was the revelation of God as Father. And, and we've talked about this before. Where, where I, I, I've commented and, and, and I've shared with you that, that up until this point, uh, mankind, and particularly the, children, particularly the children of Israel, they understood God as a God of power, a God of might, a God of authority, a God of punishment, a God of judgment. They literally had no concept of God as a father at all. And so not only, did, not only, though, did Jesus bring to mankind a revelation of God as father, but he didn't stop there. He couldn't. He couldn't. He went much further than that. See, when Jesus came to the earth, he was declaring that because he's with us, we are more we are more than the worst thing that we've ever done. So when he came to the woman that was then when he was, was uh, came to the woman that was caught in adultery and drew a line in the sand. That line in the sand wasn't between him and her; it was between him and the religious leaders. And he basically told her, "You're more. You're more than this." And when he came to the woman at the well who had all of these men in and out of her life, Jesus said to her, you know what? That's not who you are. You're actually more than that. Let me celebrate the best of you that I see instead of the worst of you that you've done. And he did that, and she became this great preacher, didn't she? She went to town and preached, and almost the whole city came to Christ because of this message of this woman who had been abused by men. With, with Matthew, his interaction with Matthew, Jesus, his interaction with Matthew, Matthew was a thief. Peter was a coward. Thomas was a doubter. Paul was a murderer. And in each of those, Jesus looked at them and says, not only do I see you, really see you, but I choose to celebrate the best of you, not the worst of you. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? And so Jesus brought to humanity this incredible revelation of God as Father. And nobody's ever, nobody thought of him in those terms at all. I'm telling you, they did not think of God. That was a huge revelation. It was mind-boggling, but Jesus couldn't stop there. He couldn't stop with just revealing God as Father because for many people in the crowd, that wouldn't be helpful because the only concept and idea that they had of Father was their Father. And it may not have been a good one, and for many it wasn't. Same is true today. When we try to describe or we're, we're explaining, we're declaring to others that God 
is a father, we can't just leave it at that. Because for a lot of folks, that's not, that doesn't help at all. Because their, their father abandoned them at five years of age and left home. Their father abused them. Their father beat them. Their father was, was mean toward them. Their father was judgmental. Their father was over strict and, and harsh in his discipline. And so people have this, that there's, there's too many, unfortunately, there's too many warped and, and hurtful and painful images that come with the word father. So Jesus just couldn't leave it at you have a father. Jesus pressed further and he says, you do have a father, but he's good. He's a good, are you hearing what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? He's a good father. He's a kind father. He's a father that doesn't constantly remind you of where you failed. He celebrates what's good in you because he's good. Are you hearing this? And because of that, that's where the, that's where the transformation takes place. That's where, well, you know, Jesus went on to say uh, to them, he says, look, I, I know that you thought it was, you're pretty blown away that I, saw you before I saw you. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I haven't seen anything yet. And then he says, from this point on, the heavens have opened. The angels of God are ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And he's painting an image. He's painting a picture of, of, of an event that took place that all of these Jewish, this whole Jewish audience completely understood what Jesus was referring to in this description. He is referring to what happened with Jacob. When Jacob had a dream, and he saw a ladder coming down from heaven, and he saw angels ascending and descending upon the earth. And that was the beginning of Jacob's life being completely transformed. See, here's the thing. There's not any of us in this room that doubt God's ability, that doubt God's power, that doubt God's authority. Where we struggle is doubting whether or not God is good. Not towards others, but towards us. See, that's why the leper looked at Jesus and said, I know you can heal me. There's no question in my mind. The rumor mill is grinding like crazy. You're healing all kinds of folks. I know you can do it. I'm just not sure you want to do it for me. I know, you're, I know you can, the leper said, but I'm not, I don't know if you're willing. And then Jesus' response is, I am willing. Why? Because Jesus says, the father I've come to represent, he's, he's a good father. He is willing to show his goodness. He's willing to leverage his power to help humanity, to rescue even those of us that deserve it the least. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so it was just this. So when Jesus is referencing this activity of heaven, he's, he, he, people know exactly what, his audience knows who he's talking about. He's referencing this event that took place in, in Genesis with Jacob. Jacob, Jacob, the guy that strove his whole life to matter. He was constantly striving to be significant and to have significance. And as a result, he lied and he pushed and he deceived and he betrayed and at the end of it all, it left him running. It left him on the run and looking over his shoulder. And here he is running from his family and running from his brother. And he still wants to be something. And he still wants to have some sense of significance to his life. And he's still striving and clawing and scratching. And finally he gets tired and he makes a pillow out of a rock and he falls asleep. And when he does, he has this dream. And let me tell you what this dream said to him. This is why it was the beginning of his transformation. Because Jacob and all of his insecurity and all of his striving, all of his lying, all of his deception, all of his betrayal, he realized in that dream that, that heaven's activity had been taking place around him the whole time. That the whole time while he was lying and deceiving and cheating and stealing and running, that the whole time God was with him. The whole time heaven was surrounding him. And everything he was looking for to make himself something, he finally realized he could find that in the goodness of God who loved him in spite of his own self and continued to be active around him even when he didn't deserve it. Are you all getting this? He is with us. It means that we, our lives, not only do our lives matter, 
But Jacob, and we need to realize this too, that, and Jesus said it in John. He says, look, from this point on, heaven's open. And, and the activity of heaven is all around us. Even when we don't feel it, even when we don't see it, even when we're not aware of it, even when it looks like life's not working, even when everything's unraveling, and even when all hell is breaking loose, here's the message. He's still with us. And listen, He's still good. And here's why this is so important. I'm going to close with this. The reason why I'm kind of you know, drilling down on this a little bit is because our ability to hope, our ability to trust, when we're going through hell, when things are unraveling, when it looks like we're going down, when it looks like it's over, when it looks like we're not going to make it, when it possibly even looks like we're going to die, when all of that's happening, our ability to trust in God during those times, our ability to hope, our ability to have a sense of confidence is not anchored just in the power of God, but ultimately it's anchored in the goodness of God that he's good toward me, that he loves me, and he's good to me. That's where my hope is. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm not going to ultimately have the hope and the trust and the faith I need just in God's power. I'll tell you where it comes from me, where, where it happens for me, how I find that ability to hope and trust is when I remind myself, yeah, I know he's powerful, but my hope is anchored in the, in the truth that he's a good God, not an evil God, not an angry God, not a vengeful God, not a painful God, that he's a good God. My hope is anchored in his goodness. My hope is, my trust is anchored in his goodness. My faith is anchored, are you hearing this, in his goodness, that he's good. I know that he's good. Here's what the psalmist said. I would have lost heart unless I believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Psalm 68, the psalmist says, God, you are good and you do only good. It's literally impossible for you to do evil because you don't just do good, you are good. Remember when Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, I'll tell you what, a whole big old thing that's good came out of Nazareth. The goodness of our heavenly father, the creator of the universe who's chosen to love us and be good to us even when we don't deserve it. Are you getting this, everybody? That's where our faith comes from. He's good. He's good. Even Job, at the end of it all, lost so much. So much loss, right, for Job? So much loss, so much pain. And he just said this, I don't even understand everything I'm going through. I can't even explain it. He couldn't explain it to his friends. The, the, the rationale they were coming up with wasn't even right. But Job didn't even know what to say. He didn't even have an explanation. He says, I don't even know why this is happening. I don't know. Here's what I do know. I know that God's good. And even in ashes, I'm going to declare His praise. And I'm going to exalt His goodness. No matter what, I'm going to believe that God's good. And He is, folks. He is good. And I'm telling you, the activity of heaven is happening around you all the time. There are angels ascending and descending upon your house. There are angels and descending, ascending and descending upon your home. The activity of heaven is happening around your home and in your marriage and with over your children and all this stuff that you're going through. I'm telling you, heaven is alive and it's been opened and it's never going to be shut again. And there are angels ascending and descending upon your life. And He is good. And he does good, and we know that he is with us. Man, can we rejoice in that? I hope, man, that encourages us. Lord, let it encourage us. Let it encourage us. Let's all stand to our feet. When Moses cried out to the Lord and said, show me your glory, that was a big prayer. The very next verse, here's what God said. I will cause my goodness to pass before you. Think about that. We think of glory, the glory of God, and we think of this kind of like vapory smoke in the mountain shaking, and, and that's all good. And that, you know, the presence of God's strong, can't hardly move. That's all true. That's all beautiful. 
But Moses says, show me your glory. And God says, all right, I'm going to have my goodness pass before you. That was God saying, look, at, at, my, at my very core, I don't just do good. I am good. You want to see my glory? I'll show it to you. It's in the form of my goodness. Isn't he good? As we sing this song, I want you to pray as you're singing, out of your heart, under your breath, whatever. And I want you to ask the Lord to show, for him to show you today, this morning, his goodness. Ask the Lord to show you his glory. Allow, listen, allow the goodness of God to pass before you in this last song. Let's respond to him. We may need to go to the table and worship him and remind ourselves of the goodness of his blood and his broken body. We may need to come and kneel here and say, Lord, you got to open my eyes. I need to see your goodness in a, in a fresh and new way. I don't know. But let's just respond. But I want you to ask him that. Ask the Lord to allow his goodness to pass before you right here in this room in this last song. Let's worship him together. Let's do it together.